So welcome to the BioExcel webinar. The webinar of today is on non-bonded libraries and BLIP, a performance portable library for computing force and energy of multi-particle system. The presenter of today are Joe Jordan from the Royal Institute of Technology and Sebastian Keller from CSCS Lugano. I'm Alessandra from the Royal Institute of Technology, hosting this webinar together with uh, Julian Singh from the University of Edinburgh. So Today's presenter are uh, Joe Jordan. So Joe Jordan got his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics at the University of Pennsylvania, and he moved to Sweden in 2018 to work uh, in Stockholm in the group of Erin Lindahl. He was doing a postdoc of a driving molecular simulation with experimental data. Then he moved to the computer center uh, of uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in 2019, KDC, and his actually position is a research and software engineering. Sebastian got, Keller got his PhD in theoretical chemistry at ATH in Zurich, Switzerland. Then in 2018 also, he moved, but he moved to Stanford University for a postdoc on GPU accelerated electronic structure simulation. Then in 2019, he went back to Switzerland and he started to work at CSCS Lugano. So now I will give the word to Joe so he can, he can start the webinar. Okay, so today uh, we're going to be talking uh, about uh, InBlib, a performance, a performant API for force calculations. So, okay, there we go. Uh, first, uh, I will say who uh, are the people who have been working on uh, this project. So, uh, myself and Sebastian have already been introduced, um, but in addition, uh, there is uh, Prashant. Kanduri at CSCS in Zurich, uh, Victor Holanda, uh, who is uh, also at CSCS in Lugano, uh, where Sebastian is, and Artem Zmarov, uh, who is at uh, PDC, the Compute Center of the Royal Technical Institute of Sweden, uh, as I am. Okay, so uh, the outline of the talk looks like this. I'll talk for just a few minutes about what InBlib is, uh, then I'll give a little bit of background that'll uh, hopefully make the talk a little easier to understand. Um, and I'll start talking a little bit about the implementation, um, but uh, Sebastian will do most of the talking there. And then at the end, uh, it'll come back to me and I'll go through some example workflows that uh, hopefully will be use cases that people are interested in. Okay, so what are the objectives uh, of the InBlib project? So I've highlighted uh, the most important one, uh, the one that requires most of the work, um, and that's to implement an API that per permits uh, existing performance portable Grumax non-bonded force calculation routines to be called as a library. Um, so there's another, uh, a number of sub goals uh, or sort of related goals, um, like being, being able to have nice C++ on Python uh, code. We currently don't have Python, although we may in the future. Um, you know, and to make the, the code uh, easy easy to get your hands on. So in terms of it being easy to get your hands on, uh, it's uh, a version of InBlib is actually shipped with uh, Gromax 2021. So you should be able to use it uh, on compute clusters that you have access to. Um, but I should go back uh, for, for a second and, and talk a little bit about uh, what Gromax is. Uh, just so we're all on the same page. So Gromax is, uh, you know, the, one of the most uh, popular uh, codes that are run on uh, high-performance uh, computers, um, accounting uh, for about 5% actually of all flops on uh, HPC systems. Um, and it's, uh, a, you know, a, a code for, for performing molecular dynamics. And it's uh, you know been developed for a long time, almost 30 years, and uh, a lot of effort goes into making sure that uh, it's high performance. Um, but until fairly recently, uh, not so much effort has gone into uh, making it easy to use the uh, the code. 
uh, and so there hasn't really been much of an API, and so that's why the IndieLib project uh, exists. Okay, so uh, another uh, reason why uh, it is relevant, especially now, uh, to have a, a project to try to expose the performance aspects of uh, Gromax um, is because we're moving rapidly into a situation where there's a massive proliferation of different kinds of hardware uh, that are uh, coming online uh, or, or have recently come online uh, in the high performance computing uh, world. And you know this is this is a good thing if uh, you're a scientist because uh, you know, more competition means uh, that the computers uh, theoretically can can be cheaper, um, and uh, you know that there can also be more competition over speed. Um, but if you are uh, the person programming uh, the these computers to to try to get the maximum performance, then then you have a little bit more work to do because uh, these different machines that I have listed here have different CPU uh, and GPU architectures. And this can be very challenging um, because, you know, for instance, you can have to write uh, an entirely different backend for each uh, GPU uh, type, as an example. And so, uh, again, this makes something like uh, NBLib uh, very important because then you can imagine uh, instead of having to go and try to, you know, for each new machine, figure out how to get the best performance, you can just say, oh, well, there's some other people who have already put a lot of work into getting the best performance for this particular type of operation. You know, I'll just call uh, their code as a library and focus on the sort of scientific things that I'm actually interested in as opposed to the uh, low level performance details. Okay, so uh, now I'll talk a little bit, of, give a little bit of background. Um, so, uh, hopefully we're all on the same page uh, at this talk on what a molecular dynamics simulation is. Um, but basically, you know, you have a bunch of uh, particles or molecules and you compute the forces of those particles or molecules and uh, use that to update the positions and, you know, basically do that over and over again to, to get a dynamic uh, picture of how uh, the positions evolve over time. And so what are the types of forces in a molecular dy dynamic simulation? Well, there's things like bonds, angles, and torsions, um, and there's uh, electrostatic repulsion, um, you know, a charge interaction, and there's also van der Waals uh, attraction. And so the, uh, the reason that the project is called NBLib is because it is a non-bonded library. Um, and so when we say non-bonded, uh, we typically mean uh, the van der Waals uh, attraction. And to a lesser extent, uh, you, you could also imagine uh, non-bonded refers to uh, electrostatic repulsion, obviously. Uh, and then you've got uh, bonds, uh, you know, other kinds of forces. Um, but the, the van der Waals uh, interactions are uh, the most computationally intensive um, and so the Leonard Jones interaction is basically one way to compute the potential of, of van der Waals forces. Uh, so it looks, uh, you know, the equation for the potential looks like this. So then you have uh, this graph, which, is, which I've taken straight from the Gromax manual. So at the lowest uh, point on the line on the graph uh, is the ener energy minima. So that's, uh, you know, where the particles are sort of happiest to be. Uh, if they move too close together, they'll get a high force. And as particles move farther apart, uh, the force will actually go uh, to, to zero, basically. Um, and uh, the fact that the forces go go to zero is uh, is important because you know if you if you've got uh, a big system and you need to compute uh, all the non-bonded uh, interactions, if the forces didn't go to zero at some relatively fast pace, actually. Uh, this would be an n squared problem, and it would be uh, computationally very challenging to make much headway. But fortunately, it's not really n squared in the total number of particles, but only in the particles within the radius. So you can actually sort of divide up, uh, divide and conquer, uh, so to speak, 
uh, the non-bonded interaction. So what does that look like? Well, you, you could imagine um, going uh, down, down the arrows here, um, you know, taking your system and dividing it up into little chunks uh, and just computing the non-bonded interactions in those chunks. And this is basically why Chromax gets uh, very good performance is because a lot of effort over many years has been put into developing this algorithm and also making sure that it runs efficiently on uh, a wide variety of hardware. So really what we're trying to do is to expose that work that's already gone on. Um, and so now I'll move to actually talking a little bit about how we've made it possible to uh, access this, this performance. Okay, so, excuse me. All right, so in order to do a uh, sim simulation, you need some particles. Um, and so uh, we actually uh, define a topology API that you can use. Um, and so particles have a name and a mass, uh, and these are the only two uh, parameters that particles have. So you can imagine the particles being atoms, or if you do coarse grain simulation beads, or you know, some, some other thing, depending on your domain of application. Um, but so in the example we're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about today to sort of walk through the implementation, uh, what we're actually gonna be building is a system with uh, methanol and water. So, so here's uh, the particles in water. You know, you've got an oxygen and a hydrogen, not so surprising. Um, and here are the particles in methanol. Um, you've got the, the methyl oxygen and the uh, ca methyl carbon. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're, we're using a united atom methyl carbon. So uh, there's, there's no hydrogens uh, explicitly attached to the carbon in this, uh, in this scheme. Okay. So the non-bonded interactions uh, are flexible. You can uh, define different kinds of interactions uh, be between the different particles in your system. Um, and so in order to uh, do that, you need something called a combination rule. And so this is actually sort of the last background that, that I'll show. So remembering the formula we had for the uh, potential, the Leonard Jones potential between uh, two particles. Um, the geometric combination rule is exactly what it sounds like. It's a geometric average of the C6 parameters of your particles and the C12 parameters of your particles. So that's all we mean by a geometric combination rule. So, well, what do you do? You take this uh, particle types interactions object uh, and you add the particles in your system to it. Um, so first here, we're adding the oxygen in the water and giving it C6 and C12 parameters uh, and we're also adding uh, the hydrogen uh, and actually giving it zero for its C6 and C12 parameters. And you can do the same thing for uh, the methanol, oxygen, and carbon uh, with, as, as you can see, uh, different parameters, uh, you know, that are from, from some force field or from some experimental uh, validation that causes you to trust that these numbers are correct, uh, you know, to, to, to your specifications, to your needs of, of the problem domain. Okay, and so in addition to being able to, you know, so for here, we're basically showing how do you define the generic things that, you know, what, that will show what the interaction of, you know, particle I and particle J will be for arbitrary particle I and J. So, you know, the combination rule is just telling you uh, how, to, how to combine the C6 for, for instance, the uh, oxygen in the water and the oxygen in the methyl. Um, but you actually might not want to use the oxygen in the water and the oxygen in the methyl geometric combination rule. You might have some more experimental data that basically says that there's some other number uh, that, that is gonna give you a more accurate uh, interaction potential. And so if you want in the Inbilib uh, interaction uh, API specification, you can you can do that. You can you can add explicitly uh, non-self interactions. Okay, so now we have some particles and we have some interactions between our particles. So the interactions again are uh, for computing the the non-bonded. Um, 
interactions, which are the, the performance uh, sensitive ones that we really care about. Uh, and so we're, we're going to add our particles to some molecules. So we're going to build a water molecule. Um, and particles in a molecule uh, must have a name. And they may have a charge and a residue name. So in the case of water, uh, we're adding our particles um, and giving them name, you know, oxygen, H1 and H2, sort of obvious names for, uh, for water. Uh, and we're giving partial charges, which again are coming uh, from uh, a force field, you know, some kind of experimental validation. Um, and then you're just adding the, as the last parameter, the, the actual particle. Um, and you can do the same thing for methanol. Um, and the one uh, interesting thing that I'll note here is since the particles are uh, themselves kind of uncoupled, you know, they're, they're, they're independent objects, you can actually add, you know, your hydrogen particle to both your water molecule and your methanol molecule. Um, so this is the hydrogen uh, on the, the oxygen in your methanol. Um, and you can use the same one, but just with a different partial charge. Uh, and now you have a different, uh, you know, now you have your two molecules, basically. Great. So uh, another thing uh, that is useful to add, uh, you know, in, in, in these kinds of simulations is something called intramolecular exclusion. So uh, if anyone is not familiar with, with what this is, this is, this is basically a performance optimization. So this is, this is saying, you know, in a minute, I'm going to show you how you add bonds. And so anything, any two particles that are connected uh, directly or, you know, closely at least by bonds, uh, the, the force from the bonds are going to be much higher than the, the forces from the non-bonded interaction. So using exclusions, you can actually say exclude particle I and particle J from the non-bonded calculation because it's a waste of time to calculate that force. And so this is what that looks like for water. You know, it looks pretty similar for uh, methanol. So all you need to do is keep track of the names of the particles in the molecule that you're adding the exclusion to. Oh, and uh, I should mention that these self-exclusions are added automatically. So uh, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't try to compute non-bonded forces with, with itself. Um, OK. so. As I mentioned, uh, you probably also want to have bonds. If you want to simulate, uh, you know, anything useful without bonds and angles and such, uh, you can simulate things like argon, uh, which is very interesting, but perhaps not interesting enough for everyone. Um, and so, you know, you can add uh, add bonds. Um, so, what does that look like? So, we have a harmonic bond type, and the parameters are the distance and the force constant. And so, you make your OH bond, and you add uh, this as interaction. So obviously in water, we need two bonds, one for each hydrogen. And that's what this looks like. And then uh, we have a similar setup for methanol. Um, so we want a different uh, OH bond, which I'm going to call OH3, um, since this is the third H uh, on the slide. Um, and it has, yeah, whatever parameters it has. And so you add that interaction to your methanol, and then you also add uh, a an O methyl bond uh, to uh, to your methanol, and so I'm not going to walk through the addition of angles and dihedrals because they look uh, very similar to bonds. So uh, now I'm actually going to hand it over to Sebastian, who is going to talk uh, more about uh, how to you know finish building the system and actually uh, run uh, using the API. Right. Does that look good? OK. So I'm going to pick it up right where Joe left it. So he described how you can create molecules from particles and bonds and angles. And before you can actually calculate forces, the remaining information that you need to supply as a user is how how many molecules of each type you want to have in your topology. 
And so we have a, a topology builder here that you need to instantiate uh, and add those molecules. And it looks like this. So you add, add your molecules and you supply as a second argument here how many of each you want. And the reason why we need this builder is because we cannot efficiently translate the, the string particle name to a sequence ID. So in order then to finally get the topology, you uh, you call topology builder dot build topology when everything has been added. And you also need to add the C6 and C12 parameters that Joe described earlier. And you also need coordinates and velocities, which you might uh, define in your program or read from an input file. And you need a buffer to hold the forces. And you need a box to specify the bounding, the coordinate bounds of your coordinate buffer that you just defined. Right, and at this point, we basically have every information you might need about uh, uh, about your topology, and you're in principle now ready to call the force API. So it's perhaps useful to recapitulate quickly what the data flow looks like. So the particles and the bonded interaction, they all go into molecules, and then the molecules, they go into the topology. And so what happens next now is that the polychi prepares for you um, the actual inputs to our uh, non-bonded force API. And so those inputs are the, the particle types, that's just an array of integers, and then the non-bonded force parameters. So that's the C6 and C12 parameters for each type, and then an array of charges for each particle. And then there's an array of interaction flags, which uh, specifies for each particle, whether the Coulomb electrostatic or the van der Waals non-bonded interaction should actually be computed. And then there's uh, another array, actually not a two array of integers de describing what particles are excluded. And so what does that look like in actual code? You also need uh, a small data stru structure with some uh, options, yeah, mostly a sensible defaults, but it, for instance, uh, controls uh, parameters such as pair list cutoffs. And just as the graphic illustrated before, you can now instantiate the, the non-bonded force calculator itself by by requesting all the input data that it consumes from the topology. And then why is it actually an object? Why can't we just make a function? That's because uh, the force calculator needs to have a, a pair list inside that uh, determines which which are the pairs of particles that actually have uh, are close enough to each other to have Van der Waals interaction. And because it's actually fairly expensive to compute this pair list, this is done only every, say, 100 steps or so. And for this reason, you, you don't want to update this pair list each time you compute forces for a given set of coordinates. And so once you've updated the pair list, you can then finally call compute. You have to give the bounding box the coordinates and then you will obtain the forces. So the forces are going to be added in this buffer supplied here. And it's important to note that actually the, the whole topology API that Joe and me just described is actually completely optional. So if you're 
if you're totally empty handed, it might be the easiest way to actually assemble the input data in order to be able to call the non bonded force API. But uh, for a lot of users, that might not be the case. So you might already have a, a TPR file from another Chrome Max calculation, and that TPR file already contains the exact same information, such as the particle types and the non bonded parameters, etc. And it also would also contain a coordinates. So the only thing you'd have to do is to uh, use the TPR file reader that and in and supply your TPR file, and then you can directly uh, use the data from there to to call the non bonded force API. And it's even worth mentioning that uh, all of the input data that the non-bonded uh, force API consumes are actually just elementary arrays of uh, int and real, or so this is float or double. So it's, uh, it's completely imaginable that you would actually be able to prepare this data yourself using a third party uh, molecular dynamics code, and then you'd still be able to uh, call the non-bonded forces from Gromax. And so that's what the alternate data source would look like in code. You'd create this uh, TPR reader and give it your TPR file. And then from there, instead of the topology, You'd be using this TPR reader to calculate uh, to in, to create the force calculator and the uh, coordinate and force buffers, and then from there you'd be able to uh, call compute and obtain the forces. We do also provide actually listed forces, which is a Chrome Max nomenclature for bonded forces. So that's everything from bonds, angles to dihedrals. And the way that this works is exactly analogous to the non-bonded force calculator. You also uh, construct the object with uh, data that you can request from the topology, and then the force calculator, the, or the listed force calculator, also offers the same, the exact same compute signature. And at this point you're actually already in a position to write the complete simple MD loop. We do have a, a very simple leapfrog integrator, but you can of course here provide your own too. And then you can just simply write a, a, a for loop over all the integration steps. Then you, you then start uh, with computing the non-bonded forces, I mean, this is assuming that here the topology box coordinates and forces has been set up as illustrated before. And then you can add a second call to compute the, the bonded forces on top. And here in this example, if I call it like this, the, the bonded forces just get added on top. And then you can uh, use those forces to move particles ahead in time by, by one time step. Here in this setup, I'd actually have to uh, zero the forces between every step because, because uh, both the bonded and non-bonded force calculator add forces on top. And you might, you might of course imagine other stuff that you're doing to the system in between, such as add your own kind of forces on top or whatever else you might imagine. And with that, I'd uh, like to hand back to Joe, who's going to uh, cover some example workflows in more detail to illustrate cases where the capability that we just described might be useful. Uh, yes. So. I'm going to talk uh, about some example workflows. Um, so 
So the first one I'll talk about is about uh, computing a subset of interactions. Um, and so there are a number of cases where this would be interesting. Uh, so I'll go over one that looks a little bit like drug docking um, and sort of give an idea, hopefully, of what it would look like to do uh, multiple time stepping or quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics hybrid. Um, and then after that, I'll uh, give, give an example about multiple states. Um, okay, so for computing a, a subset of interactions, what would that look like? Okay, so for this example, imagine you have uh, two polymers, call them polymer one and polymer two, uh, and you have some water, and you've already added your particles uh, or, and your exclusions and your interactions. Um, and so now you can uh, build a topology which represents your full system. So for, for this example, uh, you can say that the uh, full system uh, has one molecule each of polymer one and two and 100 water molecules. Um, and you can also imagine having uh, a system which is just the two polymers. Um, and then you can build uh, each of those topologies respectively, the full system and the polymer only uh, system. Okay, and so uh, while well, you set up your non-bounded fourth calculator and your listed fourth calculator and your leapfrog integrator, uh, and that looks uh, similar to the way Sebastian described, so I won't uh, belabor the point. Um, and then you, again, as Sebastian described, basically do some, some steps. Um, so you could imagine basically if, if this is a, a drug dacking uh, scenario that you have some other method, maybe some other program that gives you uh, trial coordinates basically that, that you think are going to be relevant for uh, computing the interaction energy between you know, these two uh, polymers or, in it, it, or for, for some other kind, kind of system basically. Um, uh, and so once you've, but, but, but it might be the case that you don't trust this other software completely and you kind of want to uh, relax uh, the system a little bit, give it, give it a chance to uh, move around. Um, and, and then after you've, you've done some, uh, you know, a few time steps, you know, with your full system, now you actually uh, only want to get the forces uh, for your polymer system because you've updated the coordinates uh, a little bit, uh, you know, to, to your specification. Um, and again, you don't, you don't have to use the leapfrog integrator. You could implement your own, uh, you know, stochastic gradient descent uh, minimization uh, integrator, for instance. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, you want to only get the forces or perhaps the energies um, between uh, the polymers uh, that that we're interested in here. So right now, work is ongoing uh, to to actually expose the energy as part of the non-bonded API. Um, but uh, okay, so uh, just sticking with this example just for a moment, uh, you know, I, so this is this is an example of how you could do a sort of docking thing where you want to compute the interaction energy between uh, two particles, which are a, a subset of your whole system, um, but uh, you know, we, we also uh, have uh, multiple time stepping and QM in them, which are examples uh, of subsets of interaction. So for multiple time stepping, uh, instead of having uh, one topology, which is the, the full system and one which is, uh, you know, some, uh, some set that you're interested in the interactions, then you might, for instance, divide up your system between everything that's not hydrogens and a topology that's just for hydrogens. And then you could uh, actually have a double loop where you integrate the hydrogens a few times uh, and then have a longer time step uh, than you might otherwise be able to uh, for the rest of the system, basically. Um, and for QM in simulation, it actually kind of like is this example, but turned inside out. So in a quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics simulation, generally you have uh, some other program, CB2K, for instance, um, that generates uh, forces for the quantum particles. And so basically what you would do there is instead of defining uh, your system to, uh, instead of basically defining two systems, uh, one of which is the full and one of which is only part, 
you would have one system of which one part actually has all zero interaction uh, parameters. Uh, and then in the, uh, you know, in between the force calculation and the integration steps, you would just add the forces from your other program, for instance, CP2K. Um, and through this method, you can, you can uh, get a decent uh, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics hybrid uh, simulation. Okay, so now I'll talk about uh, using NBLib to do a workflow with multiple states. So uh, there are a, a number of types of workflows that involve multiple states. So uh, I'll, I'll show an example, which actually encompasses both swarms of trajectory uh, or replica exchange. Um, and then I'll just kind of describe uh, what, uh, what it would look like to change the topology during a simulation. Okay, so in multiple states, uh, in, in this case, we actually, you know, just pretend that like you, you have your topology uh, builder, you know, as, as we've illustrated it before, um, and that you want to actually build the same system twice. Um, and so I'm going to call these systems first and second. Um, it might actually be more canonical to call them state A and state B, but uh, when, when reading code, uh, state A and state B are a little too close together. So I, I thought that the example was clear with uh, first and second. Um, but they're in this in this example that I'm showing, they're actually the same the the same topology. And so what do you do? Well, you get your coordinates and your velocities for your first system, uh, and you get your coordinates and velocities for your second system. They could be the same coordinates. They could be different coordinates. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> it's up to your imagination and the, the specific type of workflow that you're interested in, uh, what th what this would mean. And so, well, you uh, define your in in force calculator, your non-bounded force calculator, as before, um, and your integrator as before. And I'll leave out uh, the listed force calculator uh, to, for reasons of space because it doesn't really add anything uh, in terms of clarity. I think. Um, to the example. Um, so you do that for your first system uh, and you do likewise for your second system. Um, and so now you can write a loop just like the loops we've been talking about, um, you know, over however many steps you're, you're interested in doing. And basically you uh, compute uh, your, your forces for, for system first and system second, and then you integrate system first and system second. And this is actually already, uh, you know, a sort of swarms of trajectories type of workflow right here. Um, so, you know, you don't have to limit yourself to two, you know, you can go go wild uh, and do as many as you would like. Um, and you could even imagine using MPI to run uh, each one of these actually on a different rank um, on a supercomputer and get uh, some, you know, embarrassing parallelism that you don't have to do much work uh, in, in order to actually get so that you could more quickly explore phase space of some system you're interested in by basically running in copies of that system uh, in parallel as opposed to running them, you know, one after the other. And so, well, what does it look like to uh, do replica exchange? Well, all you basically need to do is add a little bit of code that gives you, you know, in this example, every 10 steps lets you swap the velocities. And so, well, why do people like to do this? Uh, one, one example is that you might have uh, different temperatures and thus different velocities uh, at, uh, you know, for your two systems. And you might want to periodically switch them because you're interested in the statistics at a lower temperature, but uh, you want to increase the exploration of phase space. And so you occasionally uh, swap the velocities or the coordinates of, of your system uh, in order to uh, f facilitate this. Okay, and so uh, just just to give some idea of how the last type of workflow uh, that that involves multiple states, um, you know, which which as I mentioned is having different topologies. Well, how how would that work? Um, yeah, let's go let's go back. So changing the topology during the simulation uh, would be as simple as basically building uh, first and second, and then having this this loop, and then after, uh, you know, if first and second in this case were actually different 
uh, and not the same topology twice, uh, you could imagine doing, uh, you know, instead of uh, every 10th step swapping the velocities, you could actually, uh, you know, write a, a different loop, which was, you know, 10 steps of system A and then build a whole new calculator uh, and 10 steps of uh, system B or uh, system second. Okay, so those are the examples that I wanted to talk about. Hopefully they were at least somewhat clear. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what our future goals are. So one of our main goals of this talk and one of the things we're really uh, hoping to be able to, to do going forward is to find some users. Uh, so, you know, we have a pretty good idea of the things we can build um, and we have what we hope are good ideas about what people will find useful but the only real way to know what people will find useful is to have users reach out to us and basically say hey we're interested in this use case you know can you prioritize uh getting such and such feature in and so we, we are quite open to this um you know uh, our, our emails like, i guess should be shared uh, as part of this uh, talk um and you know if anyone is interested in reaching out and having a conversation with us about uh, some kind of workflow or some kind of feature that they would need for a workflow that they're very interested in. These are conversations we're really excited to have. So please do re reach out uh, in this regard. Okay, and so uh, other things that we're uh, sort of already working on and thinking about are uh, mostly about performance. Um, and so uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is actually that the, the non bounded force calculator actually already works on GPUs, um, which is nice because since Gromax already has uh, basically uh, backends for all the different kinds of GPUs, you know, whatever kind of system you have, you should just, it should just work and you should just be able to run on whatever uh, sort of CPU, GPU uh, setup you have. But uh, one thing we, we don't currently have is domain decomposition, which is what you would need in order to have uh, a coupled parallel simulation. So, so I mentioned how you could easily get an embarrassingly parallel simulation where you just run one simulation per MPI rank or per node, um, whatever. Um, but if you actually want to run one simulation across nodes, uh, you, you need domain decomposition. And so uh, this is a little more complex, and so this is something we're, we're actively working on. Um, so another performance aspect that's fairly important uh, is actually uh, having nice handles for the data transfer. And so what I mean by that is both uh, from the CPU to uh, device to GPU, um, and uh, also sort of at the API boundary, um, because, you know, as a user, you know, you may want to add your own forces or, you know, get in the middle of the step the coordinates back and to do some other kind of thing. Uh, for instance, check if you are at a stopping point. Um, and so we need to come up with, uh, yeah, we, we just need to do more work uh, there. And so this again is a place where hearing from users is extremely useful so we can ha have an idea of basically which things to optimize. Um, and uh, one sort of longer term goal uh, that, that we're looking at is task scheduling. So we've been showing kind of naive uh, simulation loops um, where you just compute one thing and compute another thing. But in principle, uh, this may not give you the best possible performance. And so uh, we're, we're hoping to extend our various APIs in order to allow you to overlap these various tasks in order to actually be able to play around uh, on you know, whatever kind of hardware you have in order to try to write a good custom schedule uh, to give you the best performance. So that's uh, all we have to, to say today. Um, so I'd really like to thank uh, Bear Kess, who, uh, is uh, one of the original developers of Gromax and is uh, in uh, Stockholm uh, at, at KTH as well and has really been very helpful, uh, you know, sort of pointing the way and helping us understand some of the algorithms that were necessary in order to uh, expose uh, the IndieLib API that we've talked about today. Um, and then in addition to all the people on the IndieLib team that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we've had a lot of productive discussions with other Gromax developers, uh, namely Christian Blau, Eric Bergang, Eric Lindahl, Mark Abraham, Paul Bauer, and Soed Paul. And 
Yeah, so now I guess we'll go to a question and answer session. And uh, I really want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to our talk. Oops. Thank you, Joe and Sebastian, for uh, the very interesting talk. Um, Lucy's asked a couple of uh, quick questions. So uh, the first of those um, quick questions is, um, can other integrators be used besides LeapFrog? The integrator is... Uh totally independent from the fourth API, fourth API and you, you're you able to use whatever you can imagine there. Yeah, yeah so this is one of the things that makes uh, the, the, the API so powerful actually is that uh, any kind of workflow you, you can imagine since the components are completely decoupled and all you need is that the data have, you know, some, some certain sort of minimal amount of data, uh, you can you can do whatever you want. You can even imagine getting it uh, an integrator from some other MD code if if you wanted to do that. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, the other question that uh, Lucy had asked was, uh, can a function be included within a loop to view partial results, or is that not possible? Partial results yeah, as so, in uh, a subset of the forces, or? Uh, and for I mean, I can, I can, I don't know because I can, I'm not. I can take a guess uh, at, at what is meant here, but uh, yeah, I mean, so this is this is what I was saying about uh, data interchange or you know data transfer, basically. So uh, with all the loops we've shown, if you wanted, you know, you could, uh, you know, put in, uh, you know, a prompt that that allows you to enter in some some extra data, or uh, you know, allows you to to you know do some other kind of check, uh, and if you know, if, if the check succeeds, you know, do one thing, and if the check doesn't succeed, do another. I mean, so you can you can look at the forces now, um, and you can look at the uh, coordinates now. The, the only real caveat uh, is that if you are using a GPU, uh, there is some cost uh, of moving the data back uh, from the device to the host, uh, and you have to manage that yourself. Um, but other than that, there's, I mean, there, there's only performance limitations and not limitations in terms of like when you can look at the data or what you can do with it. Great, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question we have is from Pat, uh, Patricio Barletta. Uh, Patricio, I have unmuted your mic. If you would like to ask the question, uh, you're more than welcome to, otherwise I can read it for you. Cool, thanks. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh. Uh, Sorry, I, thanks for the talk. Uh, actually, you have just answered my first qu question about uploading to the GPU, so it is available. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, I was also wondering, it's a very specific question. Uh, do I have access, does the API expose the Gromax cell list for the current frame? That would be nice. So the Gromax what for the current frame? The cell list, you know, for, for the atoms. Ah yes, uh, no, it 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 does not. So I'm I'm very curious to hear what your use case is for wanting to look at the pair list. A machine learning uh, kind of force field. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, very interesting. So this is something we've con we've considered, and we've even looked at uh, some some uh, grant applications that uh, you know for writing a fo follow up uh, projects. Um, so this, this is an area that we're very interested in. So be very, I would be very interested to, to talk to you about uh, specifically what what you think uh, you know would would be needed there. But uh, in in principle, we can expose any kind of data. In in practice, uh, it may not be so useful because the data structures uh, you know are some more and some less uh, sort of human interactable and uh, intelligible. Um, so it would really require some further uh, specification of like what data is useful, basically. But but I'd be happy to talk more about it. Right. Yeah, it's a very specific use case. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question is from Henry Whitler, whose microphone unfortunately doesn't work. Uh, Henry says, "Interesting work. Thank you very much." Uh, can one use NBLib to estimate molecular specificity, for example, binding affinity in joules, or to quantify the force in Newton of a binding interface for, e.g., protein ligand interruptions? Yeah, so this is kind of what I was trying to get at with the uh, first example, um, 
where, you know, in that case, we were just uh, computing uh, the forces between two polymers. But, you know, if you imagine polymer one is a, a ligand or a small molecule and polymer two is a protein, then you're already basically in the situation that I think is being described by the questioner. Great, thank you very much. And uh, our final question for today comes from Jonathan Barnou. Uh, Jonathan, I do not seem to be able to unmute your microphone, so I'll ask your uh, question in your stead. Jonathan asks, Hi, are Jonathan. virtual sites supported? <laughs> uh, virtual sites are not currently supported. Um, uh, we do not have it on our roadmap to support virtual sites. Um, Although in, in principle, uh, they, they, they could be. Uh, it's just that virtual sites are a lot of extra overhead. And especially since uh, multiple time stepping uh, is you know, easily facilitated um, by the, the API we have outlined. Uh, and you know, furthermore is like, uh, I don't want to say more correct, because actually in testing, uh, it, it has some instabilities because some of the force fields uh, have not been developed for multiple time stepping. But uh, you can imagine as, as force fields uh, evolve that uh, basically just integrating the fast interactions as much as is needed uh, for one period of slow interactions, that uh, this would mean that virtual sites can, can go away. So uh, unless there's a really compelling case uh, I don't think that at any point in the too near future we would uh, in, investigate virtual sites. But I'd be interested to hear what uh, specific use cases uh, uh, Jonathan uh, would think are enabled. Uh, so Jonathan replied saying that virtual sites are heavily used in the Martini force field. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, I should have known. Um, uh, yeah. All right. So it's it's something we can we can look into. Um, uh, it uh, yeah. It we would have to revisit our topology API uh, in order to figure out what it would take to to support this. Um, but but it it could in principle be possible. Great. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, so with that, uh, we come to the end of our webinar. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Thank you very much, Sebastian and Joe, for uh, coming and giving this uh, very interesting talk and answering all of the questions. Thank you also to all of our attendees for uh, coming to this talk. And I wanted to finish by uh, mentioning that um, there is another BioXL webinar happening on uh, Tuesday, the 30th of March, uh, titled Applying the Accelerated Weight Histogram Method to Alchemical Transformation, which will be given by Bert Hess and Magnus uh, Ludborg. Um, it should be a really interesting webinar, and we hope to see as many of you there as um, can come. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day.